Right guys, let's start with this week's Immunology and Biotechnology class and like I said in the GEM module this week we will start with our uh, biotechnology topics okay this first one is going to be a pretty brief introduction or overview of biotechnology sort of lay sort of laying some groundwork for our uh, future topics okay and here is the learning objective now the first one is kind of kidding create a clone of yourself that can study take tests and go to work while you stay home and do nothing um, so that is just uh, somewhat of a joke. The second one, okay, those are you know, somewhat tied to the um, biotechnology outcome that I listed in the syllabus. And the third one, the, some of the historical highlight, uh, those are more of a FYI information. I never asked historical events in great detail anyway, okay? So biotechnology, you know, biotechnology, it's, the term is not anything new. It is more than 100 years old. Right. Uh, so the term was very first coined by uh, someone named Carl Erke, okay, in 1917. All right. His definition is uh, a you know really means the productions or products from raw materials with an aid of living animals. Okay. So it's a pretty basic uh, type of definitions. Now this guy is from uh, is a Hungarian engineering uh, engineer. Okay. Um, at that time, these terms are just basically for large-scale productions of pig, okay, using sugar beets as a food source, okay, feeding them, uh, you know, with a particular food and give them, uh, you know, give rise to more meat, okay, that is basically what biotechnology meant at that time of the year. So, uh, what is biotechnology? So these days, it could be, uh, you know, defined as any technology that relies on living organisms or biological systems, things that we sometimes do at home, like baking bread, making beers. Some anyone make it, uh, make beer at home? Uh, you could do that. Okay, very simple. All you need is uh, yeast. Okay, yeast, uh, baker's yeast or brewer's yeast. Uh, the technical name is. Uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay, uh, so so those are biotechnology in a sense, and uh, uh, you know in that regard, really, uh, uh, I don't know if you are aware. I have an entire uh, course basically uh, it, for the first year foundation started this past fall semester. Uh, it's the name is food science and culture. Uh, so almost entire course I talked about food and science and uh, technology integration things like that. So uh, just some of FYI uh, that is some of my personal passions and pursuit in a way of saying. Now uh, some of the uh, evolution of biotechnology. Now here you are going to see a timeline following uh, animations uh, with some of those bullet points. I won't talk to it one by one, uh, but let's look at the animations here. Like so, first uh, we have a uh, Jenna using living microorganism to protect humans from diseases, and then we have Charles Darwin, you know, uh, defining the evolutionary uh, adaptations. And then we move on to Louis Pasteur, okay, uh, you know, proving the existence of microorganisms, and Gregor Mendel, uh, famous for Mendelian genetics, okay, looking at traits and being passed down from generations to generations. And we have uh, uh, Johan isolating DNA from uh, nuclei of white blood cell. Now, of course, at that time, the term, uh, you know, DNA is not as well defined and as later on and then as the timeline move on again we have uh, Walter Shorten you know give the name gene for what Mendel, Mendel okay identified and then it's moving to more modern age okay we have Alexander Fleming discovery the antibiotics you know of property of molds and we have more uh, you know, a, a group of scientists uh, identifying the DNA as the genetic material. There was a time there. There's a debate between, um, you know, it's protein, 
the, the, the genetic material or is DNA the genetic material? So there is a uh, evolve uh, in, the, in the debate and uh, in the science concepts there. All right, some of these uh, basic review, okay, you've learned uh, much of those from uh, your biochemistry class last year, and uh, here just some of the recap, chemical structures and uh, matching of DNA bases, okay, James Watson's and Francis Craig uh, determining the double helix structures, okay, of the uh, the DNA. Okay, um, so all these DNA technically, uh, you are twisting in one direction and uh, we usually call these B DNA, B form DNA, um, just a FYI detail here. Uh, I personally work with DNA molecules uh, my whole life since I started PhD so uh, that's something that I'm passionate about. Okay, And in terms of the involvement, you know, further involvement uh, in the genetics, uh, there is the um, in 1957, okay, um, so there is a breakthrough in explaining the central dogma, uh, okay, where it basically tells you go from DNA to RNA and then from RNA to protein. So that is the uh, really the central dogma DNA to RNA, oops, and the RNA to protein. So, and then, uh, Later on, uh, this Marshall and uh, several guys okay determine the um, DNA sequence of uh, three bases, three base, three nucleotide base uh, is what it constitutes to a, a specific amino acid that lead to twenty different amino acids, which is the basic um, build up building block of our uh, protein. All right, so uh, you learn all these. So I kind of go through it very briefly. Three bases, ATG, and each of those. Uh, some are overlapping, and and you that will yield your um, amino acid during the um, transcription uh, process. All right, further down. Okay, further down. Now this one is a little bit more complicated. That's why I'm not making any animations for it. Uh, that actually took me way too long to make that animations. Well, I have a, st a template to start with. Okay, just to be fair, I didn't make from scratch. So, uh, in 1973, okay, so Cohen and Boyer, okay, uh, produced the first recombinant DNA organism. Okay, so that is really a uh, part of the breakthrough which lead to recombinant DNA technology and uh, the beginning of genetic engineering also that is uh, all the biologics okay we've been talking about uh, in the gem module it's uh, pretty much they all start from the basic concepts of recombinant DNA technology there okay and then lead to monoclonal antibody productions and then later on you know rather than having a specific scholar okay one or two scholar doing the work uh, th there's a boom in biotechnology industry Gen and Ted one of the pioneer uh, in the in the industry okay uh, you know producing first human proteins in microorganisms okay and then all leading to to producing insulins from E. coli. So E. coli can be manipulated in many ways that can produce many proteins that we want. Alright, further down, uh, Gen and Ted again produced uh, human growth hormones and uh, really, you know, transformed, uh, you know, the, the industry in a way. So looking at the details of what um, Gen and Ted producing the uh, looking at the detail of insulin productions uh, with E. coli cells, basically there it was a synthetic versions of human insulin gene that was constructed and put into a bacteria. Okay, with a plasmid. With a plasmid, we're going to talk about these plasmid, which is circular, small, small circular DNA uh, with a recombinant. Uh, genes in there um, and lead to pr protein productions. So that was the um, a little bit more, you know, detail. So you're putting human genes essentially into a bacteria. Now further down with the uh, evolution bout of biotechnology. Now it's still you know not recent. Okay, we're talk still about talking about twenty up to twenty years ago, and there is um, <coughs> more of a 
you know, le legal aspect to it, okay, as more of the uh, biologics are being produced, they were saying that, okay, genetic like genetically manipulated organism can be patented okay so so they are uh, a so basically this give you more incentive give company more incentive to uh, spend resources to uh, investigate in those uh, genetically ma manipulated organisms so that they can uh, profit out of it further down it's just some of the hallmarks of certain uh, recombinant protein hit in the history and again I these things are just for FYI I won't ask you uh, really in detail that at all all right and then one of the more famous thing Dolly and uh, I remember um, seeing the news when it came out when they announced there is this clone sheep okay first mammal being successfully cloned from a adult somatic cell somatic cell i.e cells that are not from germline not not your uh you know the sperm cells or egg cells okay any type of a cells okay called somatic cells and uh you know i like i said i remember seeing those in, in the news uh back then probably chances are you're not you were not born yet okay so that makes me feel old <laughs> witnessing uh the birth of uh dolly <laughs> okay anyway so in a very brief way now these are you know like i said pretty old technology now uh in terms of getting the things and not you know are we doing it good uh that's another question really it took then an egg from a sheep you know remove the nucleus and then take another uh take the nucleus from a different sheep and you know sheep one and then putting the uh the, the nucleus into um the surrogate mother's egg and then put it back in it back to the mom uh, and then give rise to a uh, sheep with the genetic material from the where it carries the nucleus so that is the uh, idea of the entire cloning there and since then there's so many m different mammals are being cloned um, particularly in some countries uh, like Korea Korea they are very good at uh, cloning dogs for some reason they they are better uh, dogs from sometimes they are difficult to clone um, so just some of the trivial thing and I these days there has been less research in cloning I feel like there's less um, scientific paper being published because again these are old and okay you clone an animal then what's next okay what well, part of the problem is uh premature aging okay when you take the dna from the original uh take the nucleus for example from sheep number one the first step here the gray uh gray face sheep okay depending on the age of that sheep okay if it is at five years old it, you know you take that dna what it gives rise it, it, to the animal when if even though it was first born it would be five years old in the um in the cellular age okay part of the uh, the problem uh here we're kind of going beyond the the slide but which is okay uh, uh, part of the problem is here we have a uh chromosomes okay any all living things here we have chromosomes uh and in the chromosome here there is this uh, cap here uh, telomere okay telomere is some of those uh, things that uh, DNA with each replications these telomere uh, would be uh, degraded would degrade it would get shorter and shorter so and then lead to uh, that has been tied to aging process okay telomerase is the, the the enzymes that would degrade these ending there so when at five years old okay uh, for a sheep it's way shorter than a sheep at a natural zero years old or firstborn so you carry these genetic material to this clone sheep basically you're carrying over a five-year-old uh, cellular signature to a newborn so that is one of the biggest hurdle in cloning uh, animals so uh, that is premature aging there's nothing uh, we could do about uh, manipulating these telomerase activity yet okay now on the other hand if you learn how to manipulate it you people can win you know combat aging so uh, other than these, uh, you know, cloning animal and doing research purposes, there are other uh, practical usage uh, 
very commonly in agricultural. Okay, so you are go, uh, basically putting genes. Okay, putting genes into animals, make them grow faster, grow more lean meat, or or some other more uh, be more uh, disease resistant. So for 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 food production, in in a sense, they are good increase food uh, yield. All right, plant plant is one of those uh, area that is frequently being being manipulated uh, to increase crop uh, yield, resistance to disease and stress. And um, at our own Wilkes University, all right, uh, Doctor Terzaghi, okay, Doctor Terzaghi, all of you. That are from Wilkes student uh, did undergraduate at Wilkes, um, had him in bio one twenty one I believe that is the course number. So he's a plant biologist and he's actively uh, doing these genetic manipulations with plants, uh, in the school. Okay, uh, in the school. So uh, they, he's uh, frequently investigating putting um, uh, the uh, resveratrol producing genes into other into other plants. Okay, res resveratrol has been um, tied to uh, benefit uh, from it's the beneficial compounds that have been uh, identified in wines and things like that. Okay, so uh, this is uh, this has been done. Plant genetic manipulation has been done everywhere everywhere now. Right, industry. Okay, we are you know people are interested in producing proteins in manufacturing process, and uh, again here uh, in in my lab. Okay, in my lab, I also use uh, biotechnology to produce a particular uh, protein that uh, it's for uh, you know huge use, and which we'll come back to it. All right. So the protein that I produce is tag. Okay, tag. <laughs> um, we'll talk. We'll talk about it when we talk about uh, in the content of it. All right, and then uh, environmental. So uh, basically, they try to build. Okay, uh, you know, or uh, make organisms that can do different functions. Perhaps uh, eat up the oil. Okay, or eat up other um, harmful compounds. Okay, so there was a. Uh, Projects again between uh, between one of my former master students and uh, Trizaghi, uh, Doctor Trizaghi's uh, project was to maybe we can you know investigate or creating a a genetic elements where it can recognize a herbicide and then uh, maybe putting it back into a plant, okay, putting it back into an algae and lead to uh, making a bioremediation uh, type of a plant which can degrade atrazine. So those are some of the things that we've been uh, thinking wildly in at, at Wilkes, at Wilkes University here. All right, so, uh, so that is the um, uh, environmental biotechnology. Medical, okay, all of those that we've been learning, all the vaccines, different uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, many, many of those are, you know, being utilized with um, biotechnology there. All right, coming back a little bit, so I have one term I want to, uh, you know, tell you guys. Uh, so you always heard of synthetic chemistry, okay, we're making chemical molecules, and these days these biotechnology, uh, particularly manipulations of uh, genetic components, also lead to a field called synthetic, uh, synthetic biology, synthetic biology, okay, synthetic biology. In a sense, I consider myself doing a little bit of those work where I manipulate a lot of uh, DNA components, uh, it, the, the basics of it, okay. All right, some of the social impact, uh, you know, clearly, uh, the, the, when the uh, GMO, genetically modified food, uh, right, uh, first came out uh, and uh, people feel great, and then soon after that, uh, you know, people have concerns on safety. Are they safe? Okay, to consume. Okay, are they safe for the environment? So those things are some of the uh, concerns the general public health. Okay, um, and would if you genetically manipulate too much of a microbe, okay, so are, are they going to cause any harm? Again, ethical consideration, that is a big thing, okay. Are we creating, okay, uh, potentially genetically altered humans, okay, which happened just recently, right, right, right when I talk about uh, the baby that uh, that were manipulated in, in order to have 
to be resistant, partially resistant to HIV infection. So those were uh, some of the uh, real ethical issues. So if we can do that, like uh, you know, to take out a disease-causing gene or related gene, uh, are we going to do it to enhance our ability, mental? ability or physical ability so or or maybe design a baby okay so those are all some of the real ethical considerations of course currently there are uh, ex uh, specific law that ban these uh, research and uh, particularly when you are doing uh, genetic um, corrections okay in uh, human embryos they have a rule that you won't allow this uh, that embryo develop after seven days you know beyond seven days period so you're just observing uh, the changes uh, at the very early stage of the uh, embryo development and then you have to stop it if you don't stop it you're breaking the, the law and uh, you're gonna be in trouble so here is a summary chart that where different a lot of different um, uh, fields of biology related field uh, you know will feed into molecular biotechnology and then leading to different uh, productions of outcomes that uh, we uh, consumers or more laypersons are enjoying crops drugs vaccine diagnostic and livestock okay so uh, it's impacting every aspect of our life in, in a sense like to talk about a little bit on old school old school genetic engineering so I said old school because uh, these are techniques that are being done uh, everywhere in academic and they are not new anymore um, so there are uh, more new school genetic engineering, uh, so called the CRISPR Cas uh, CRISPR Cas9, uh, you know, editing. So uh, those are more new school. But let's go with the old school first. Okay, so uh, the again the definitions really is to modify the genetic information by directly changing its genome, ge directly changing genome with recombinant DNA technology. Right. So uh, the idea is to insert a gene of interest from one genome to another uh, utilizing in vitro recombination. So it, basically those things are done ahead of a time outside of a cell and then putting it back to the cell uh, to uh, lead to a change in the final product. No, we're not. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. Okay. <laughs> And the uh, uh, technology, there is a term called cloning. Okay, cloning. Now, cloning. Uh, a lot of time, people say clone. Okay, you think about dolly or clone an animal or identical copy there. Uh, but in a scientific field, cloning. This term is actually not essentially all all the way clone to uh, the clone to an animal. Okay, a lot of time it's you are cloning a pieces of a particular gene or DNA into. Uh, inserting into another organism, you clone part part of the uh, the gene of interest. All right, that is done uh, you know, really on a multi. Uh, what what should I say? So this is done really a lot in everywhere. Okay, even even at uh, small places. So the strategy uh, uh, here is pretty general. Uh, you don't have to really memorize the steps in a sense. Again, these materials will be run exam three, and I have not been able to decide what to do with exam three yet. We still have some time to think about it. So, uh, you know, take this chance just to to enjoy and learn the material. And I'm in my opinion, uh, don't worry too much about memorizing particular things. You know, we can be very flexible in this class to be sure. I right, and. So the step here one to five, five sorry the step here one to five and we are talking about first we need some kind of a DNA from a donor okay to be extracted and isolated and then we'll cut the piece of DNA out with uh, sometimes with restrictive endonucleases we'll talk about each of those step in a greater detail and then putting it back okay cutting it out putting it back in uh, in the with a ligator or splice it back with a cloning vector. Uh, with, that was compatible with uh, the endonuclease enzyme and then putting it back into the whole cell we have different process in bacteria whole cell we call transfections in uh, eukaryotic we do uh, called transformations okay and 
then you would need to use some tool to do selections to see uh, if the, your uh, clones are successful, maybe in putting it with some antibiotic resistance and reporter genes. Essentially, okay, uh, people, uh, students, you guys, uh, you know, every class there are some uh, of your classmates doing uh, research with me in my lab and we do a lot of these steps okay we don't complete all completely do one to five but essentially we're doing very similar process on a uh, sometimes it's monthly weekly basis okay depending on the project time all right here are some of the graphical illustrations of each of those steps so you can have a pink illustrated a uh, squiggly blob of material called a source DNA and we have a cloning vector so a cloning vector is a uh, usually a circular piece of uh, DNA okay it's a circle um, so you need to uh, cut it up okay you need to break into uh, a straight line and then tie it okay okay and then and then put your um, um, your uh, pieces of target gene okay after processing it with restrictive restriction enzymes and then with a process called ligations okay ligation is something I like I said I do uh, we do very much in my lab and uh, put it back in it uh, sticking it back stitching it back now you have a new plasmid with your target of uh, gene interest and put into the whole cells and then that plasmid genes uh, will contain uh, genetic codes that can produce protein utilizing the host cell uh, protein mechanisms and then you get the protein inside the cell. Now ideally you want these proteins like I said in the other class to, to secrete it back into the environment okay if not yeah you can also do you can also break the cells and, and extract the protein of interest okay so these uh, process are called transfections or transformation depending on what cells you are using okay now how do you cut the gene here uh, here you use uh, something called restrictive endonucleases right endonuclease is basically just cutting from inside exonuclease you cut from outside okay at the end of the DNA endo meaning in between uh, a, 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 a strand okay not the three prime end five prime to three prime not the end those are exo endos are somewhere in between there three five prime to three prime ends okay so they can recognize okay certain enzyme different enzyme can recognize specific site and where it can cut very specifically uh, with a uh, hanging hang hang hanging tail there and these tails will be used to as as a stitching point to ligate into a um, into the plasmid those are called sticky end okay now you don't need to recognize any of those sequence for cleavage okay there's no point of memorizing even uh, for me I don't memorize these things and you can always look it up uh, on the internet very very easily okay no one memorize right then uh, here is one of the technique okay after you have uh, the, the DNA okay being uh, you know produced or you know uh, ligated in a way so there's a change in size okay perhaps your original plasmid for example I'm just giving a, a, a brief example 100 base basis long okay basis long and then your target gene perhaps is 50 okay that piece of gene you put in is 50 basis long and then this all together you have 150 basis long right so you have an increase in generally uh, in general speaking when you do a um, ligations uh, or trying process your plasmid size increased okay now there's a very crude way to first see if you did the right thing is by uh, doing agarose gel electrophoresis again these things we uh, in my lab <laughs> I can't keep saying in my lab uh, in fact it is doing on a uh, daily basis when uh, things are active okay particularly in the summer these things are very much active now DNA molecules are a uh, negatively charged molecule okay uh, the electrophoresis idea uh, it's quite simple and straightforward basically applying a um, a field of uh, electricity with uh, different uh, 
different charges, okay? Use uh, negative charge and positive charge, and based on electrostatic attractions, the DNA uh, that is loaded on this piece of agarose gel will uh, migrate, okay, toward the positive charge. And depending on the size, okay, the smaller the size, okay, will migrate quicker, okay, migrate quicker to the positive sign, uh, positive uh, charge, while the uh, largest fragment would stay more on top okay uh, people that uh, that have done lab with me know know exactly the process uh, well agarose gel is agarose uh, you know coming back a little bit are these uh, compounds that extracted from uh, kelp or seaweed type of a uh, uh, material okay uh, sources uh, see, uh, and then you extract these agarose uh, you can and then you can make into molecular grade for experiment and then you can make into um, food grade okay for a food called agar agar okay agar agar that's more like a vegetarian jello type of thing now it's not as bouncy as jello it's pretty brittle you can break it apart uh, but it's a common dessert uh, ingredient in a lot of the asian country there so uh just a side note though um uh, so these agros, uh, what it does basically is serve as a uh, molecular scythe. Okay, they have uh, a, a mesh network of things, and uh, the higher percentage uh, component of the agros, the f the finer the scythe. Okay, and versus the lower one, we have a bigger hole, and things will move quicker. If you have a smaller hole, uh, things will move slower. Okay, just when you like you are doing. Uh, if you do any type of baking, if you want to scythe your 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 um your your flour, okay, you 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 look using a, a, a scythe that is fine and then it goes down slower, right? So uh, a lot of the time, these biotechnology and doing experiments make make the process you do uh, in cooking and particularly in baking. So that's something that I always tell my research student uh, when they first start in my lab is like, do you like cooking okay uh now if i i find that in general mo a lot of the people like to do research are okay at least they don't resist of learning how to cook okay uh so that is some trade that um goes along with many scientists i know many scientists are great cook okay um so uh to stick these uh sticky ends here now you don't need to know the the great detail uh basically there is a enzyme we call ligase okay doing ligation so let's use ligase okay so the you know they will help with these uh you know stitching it back of these ending again i have those at in my lab uh every day so some of the uh, common uh, restriction endonucleases, like I said, these restriction recognition sites are, uh, you know, these informations are widely available. It's almost uh, no reasons to to uh, to memorize it at all here. It's really uh, FYI. The Echo R1, one of the more uh, common one, okay, more of the common one that that you may have heard of it. Um, now these are cut for uh, for a so-called um, sticky end some do cut for a blunt end okay where the the, the thing being cut is uh, is a is a blunt blunt not not doesn't have an overhang there all right so uh here is the assuming you know the dna sequences you can map out uh, restriction endonucleosides and if you know the particular gene okay if you know the particular sequence of the gene then you can uh, search it out from this uh, massive code of atgc that makes you feel dizzy and choosing the right endonucleases and you can cut up the cut out the uh, the good fragments uh, for the next step of process Right. Uh, the next step process we're talking about the the cloning vector or the plasmid. Like I said, these are the um, circular piece of the DNA. Okay, this is one of the earlier one. Now you don't don't memorize these these name. Okay, uh, just you know that here just for for um, for correctness or completeness. Okay, these uh, plasmid have a uh, feature where they can uh, independently. Uh, having a uh, replicant that will generate uh, protein if transformed into the bacteria cells. Usually, there is some type of a selectable marker containing a uh, 
uh, gene uh, for uh, antibiotic resistance. Most commonly used is ampicillin resistant genes, and there is specific uh, also the uh, cloning site where they can recognize by um, restriction endonucleases there. So this is echo out. So there are different restriction sites where you can cut it, and then so you you the idea is you cut the original gene, okay, cut out that piece, and then you use a, uh, a similar, okay, um, the uh, enzyme to cut the specific part on the plasmid so that you have a uh, same cutting, okay, and then it will fit and it will stitch it, it can be stitched back with your ligase there, okay. So there's other vectors, uh, some uh, containing uh, uh, the, so this is the PU uh, series. Uh, they are um, quite commonly used. Okay, quite commonly used, and uh, I have some of those in my lab as well. So they have, in uh, addition to the um, uh, to the gene that you confirm uh, for uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, which you can do for selection later on, which we'll talk about in later slides. And we also have uh, different genes, such as the LAXZ genes, okay, uh, basically responsible for uh, metabolizing uh, the uh, lactose uh, on, uh, for the organisms there. And it will confirm some of the um, proper in, in, insertions of your um, DNA molecule. Right, so how to do the transformations, okay? Now you have, assuming after you all the steps uh, that you've done, you have your, your plasmids with your target gene here represented by a, a squiggly you know, line there, and then we, assuming you want to do a, uh, you know, trans, trans, you know, clone into a bacteria cell, okay, clone into a bacteria cell, how is it gonna go inside, right? It's not like, uh, will just you know naturally uptake these these uh, plasmids. One way of doing it is doing uh, electroporation. So so uh, basically shock them a little bit, uh, give them a, a little bit uh, voltage, high voltage electric field pulses, and then the, uh, the cells undergo stress or the membrane have a little bit small leaky hole. The DNA can migrate into the openings of the cell. So that is one way of doing it. Uh, I don't do it this way. In my lab, I use heat shock. Okay, uh, heat them up a little bit. Just just suddenly go from hot to cold, cold to hot, and then you under stress, and uh, that's how I do this um, cloning step in my lab. And there's other way of doing it. Uh, one way is using a uh, molecule called dextrin. Okay, a uh, th these dextrin's molecule are positively charged and will bind to negatively charged uh, group of the the DNA, and it will uh, these complexes subsequently will be uh, binding to the negatively charged plasmid, and uh, basically these dextrins are acting as a uh, carrier. Okay, you know, and there's a uptick through endocytosis, uh, and then uh, it can be also used, you know, further assist by osmotic shock, i.e., having a uh, different concentration of salt, okay, compared to the inside of the cell, make them under stress, and then uptake these uh, plasmid or genetic material vectors. So, what are these uh, antibiotics genes uh, used for um, for for screening? Basically, is well, for example, you are having uh, this ampicillin resistant gene in a vector now. The the pro the bacteria did it, after the transformation they have this original genome okay big genome here and then now they have a small circular plasmid which can produce an enzyme okay basically a beta lactamase uh, now that they can inactivate penicillins now with those death cells that without this plasmid will not be able to uh, resist ampicillin and the idea the quick way to 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 screen for these bacteria is putting on a plate. I know you guys never had, um, you know, microbiology uh, lab, but the idea is, you know, you grow these bacteria on the plate. Those that with the plasmid will grow, and those without plasmid, okay, will not grow in this sense. 
Um, so these are some of the basic concepts that I tell my student in lab uh, every time they start doing these, uh, the first time they're doing these uh, experiments. So there's another gene, okay, it's a reporter gene. Okay, reporter gene here, uh, I take one example, is the lac -Z genes, okay, lac -Z genes. Uh, the idea uh, is the instructions can sometimes can interrupt, okay, interrupt the gene, okay. Now this is a second layer of uh, screening. The first layer is to screen here, is it, do you have, all right, plasmid? Yes. Or no, okay. This is the first step, and here you are screening gene of particular interest. Yes or no, all right. Sometimes you can have a plasmid being inserted into the organism, but they don't. That plasmid was not successfully ligated with the uh, gene of interest. So, so you need something to tell you quickly, easily, uh, if you have that particular um, gene. So, uh, so that gene, reporter gene, is called Lexi gene. So, in this case, the compounds being uh, utilized for screenings is lactose, right? So, for an organisms that can uh, successfully uh, that have a complete Lexi gene, they will be able to metabolize the lactose. Now, uh, we have a special uh, type of a lactose that is called XGL. Now, don't ask me what X scale stands for, because this is a very long name, a very long name for X scales. Uh, it is a special type of lactose where after metabolized, okay, being metabolized by the um, bacteria, it will form a blue color as sh shown in this picture. So these picture in these pictures, all these dots is an individual. Uh, bacteria colony uh, that are able to metabolize lactose. Okay, having these uh, blue dots. Okay, again, I this is exactly the same thing that I do in my lab. And if you have a particular gene being inserted into the plasmid, uh, chances are you know you are designing in a way that it will disrupt. Right, it will disrupt the lactose genes uh, and ended up you know with the insertions, your lactose gene is will be broken will be broken and then in that sense your, um, your your bacteria will not be able to metabolize lactose anymore now will not be will not be able to metabolize lactose when it's exposed to X scale the colony will stay white okay so in this way you are screen you know you're a double screen okay you screen for so uh, do they have the plasmid? Yes. Okay, they will grow. If they grow and then stay white, that means your particular particular gene is successfully inserted into the plasmid, uh, and uh, the lactose gene is being disrupted in this way. All right. So I know there's a little bit too much, perhaps for you to to digest. Again, I don't you guys, I don't want you guys to memorize this particular fine detail. Uh, you know, like I said, don't worry about memorizing things from this point on. Okay, I you know trust me. Okay, trust me. And then, so that is uh, the way of doing using uh, cloning using plasmids. Now, there's also other way uh, to use uh, to do clone, which is retroviral vector. So these are uh, you know viruses you know that are able to uh, insert their uh, part of the material into the genome. So essentially, that's what. Uh, retrovirals does to humans, right? Think about uh, HIV, right? One of the most famous or most commonly discussed retrovirus in uh, in the classroom. So these retrovirus have the natural ability to insert genetic material into our genome. And uh, these retroviral vectors, um, uh, you know, <coughs> sorry, these retrovirus vectors are made to uh, create I mean, being modified to create a safe and effective way to deliver uh, the gene to the organisms. So you don't need to know the uh, great detail about retroviral transformations. The idea, uh, the base, the main idea for retroviral transformation is these viruses, this manipulated virus, should not be able to uh, replicate itself. Okay, once it goes into the cell, deliver the material, that's it. Okay, so they should not have um, the genes that can uh, 
that can contain viral protein, so they do not complete a viral cycle in a sense. So they should be just doing this one-time uh, delivery. That's all, and then basically they disassemble and dissipate it inside the cell. So that is the the main idea. Now, after you do all these tra transformation transfections, uh, which are Every process you do to insert the uh, genetic material into your target organism, all right. So it will then lead to a use of a technology called uh, PCR or RT-PCR to verify. Okay. Now you can do all this screening. Okay, with the um, with the selective plate, right? But then there's usually that's not good enough. Okay. I it happens to me. It happens to me many times. Uh, in my lab, I don't do extra verifications, and I send it out. My success rate is about uh, 30 40 percent. Okay, high day would be 60 percent success rate. Now, if I do one more step, potentially the, the success rate is higher, but then there is other factor involved cost and time and labor. Okay, so uh, I don't do uh, extra step, but in uh, in the industry, okay, after the basic screening, they would do uh, polymerase chain reactions or RT PCR or uh, reverse transcription um, PCR reactions to verify the particular product. Now, it's getting long here in this lecture, and we will wrap up here. All right, we're not going to do any questions today uh, because uh, the biotechnology is best learned by reading and practice, not by doing uh, exact. A lot of questions. Again, we're doing some quiz questions in uh, on D2L already, so I'm not going to do uh, the millionaire. It gets old, right? It, after a while, it gets old. Uh, so we'll 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 not do millionaire, uh, and we'll wrap up this lecture. Uh, we'll come back. We'll come back to uh, to talk about uh, PCL and then and how it, these relate to your assignment for the week. All right, and I'll see you in the next set of video.